Hi. My name is Chris Fritton, and in late 2014, I quit my job and hit the road. Sounds like the American dream, right? But it wasn't all fun and games. For the last three years, I've been doing a project called the Itinerant Printer, where I travel all around the US and Canada visiting different letterpress print shops. To date, I've visited 138 shops, and I've gone to 45 states, four provinces, one district. I've racked up 50,000 miles, and I've also gotten 11 parking tickets, six missed toll tickets, four speeding tickets, and had the car towed twice. So, still sound like the American dream. Now, some of you guys are probably already thinking, letterpress printing, what is that? So I'm gonna give you guys a crash course in letterpress printing. All letterpress printing is relief printing, meaning you're printing the raised surface of a block as opposed to the recessed area. It's a lot like a stamp. And I work with what's called movable type. So on each block is an individual character, like the letter A, the letter B, and type can be made of all kinds of different materials, like wood type, metal type, and then printers also work with border material, ornaments, and what we call cuts. And cuts are image blocks, and they can be made of just about everything. Copper, wood, magnesium, like Tickle Me Elvis back here. Or they can even be made by hand, like this little bunny that's going on an adventure. Now, the objective of letterpress printing is to take all those different elements, your wood type, metal type, border, and ornament, and pull them into a form for printing, and a form just consists of all the printable elements and then all the spacing. Once you have your form, you take it to a press, like these antique platen presses here. And if it's a little bit bigger, you take it to a proofing press. And the proofing press works with poster size forms. All the press does is helps facilitate inking the form and carrying a sheet of paper over top of it. When the paper makes contact with the form, you have a print. One form at a time, one print at a time, sounds time consuming, right? It is, but it gets worse. <laughs> Believe it or not, you have to print one color at a time using one form at a time when you're doing letterpress printing. So if I'm doing a five color gig poster, I actually have to print the yellow first, and then the pink, then the blue, then the orange, and then the black, using separate forms for all of them. You have to clean the press in between, and usually you wait a day. So if I'm doing a five-color poster, it might take me five days or more. Now, what do I do with letterpress printing? I make all kinds of artist books, event posters. I make a lot of gig posters for bands. You might recognize some of these. A lot of mid-level indie bands, Sleater Kinney of Montreal, for you punk rockers out there, the Dead Kennedys. I also make limited edition art prints. And when I'm on the road, I can't bring any of this incredibly heavy equipment with me. So no type, no presses. I work from the idiosyncratic collections of wood type, metal type, border, and ornament that all of the shops have. That way, the things that I make there become an index of my time as well as an index of what they have in their collection. So when I'm out there on the road, just bringing paper and ink, I do postcard sized pieces like this and poster size pieces like this. To date, I've made over 20,000 prints on the road, and because those prints are multiple colors, like we just talked about, it's taken over 45,000 impressions, or runs of the press, to make it happen. Now this idea of a traveling printer is nothing new. In fact, my whole project is based on a historical notion of itinerant printers, or tramp printers, they call them hobo printers, and the guys in the business just called them travelers. Just post the Civil War, the 1860s, they developed the International Typographical Union. And if you had a union card, you could travel anywhere in America and pick up a job. You could work in Chicago for two weeks, quit, move to Cincinnati, work there for two weeks, quit, move on to Kansas City. The union was so strong that they actually had to post the hours that were to be worked. And if you had a card, you could show up at the union shop, show them your card, and you had a job. I've read plenty of first-hand accounts of guys even picking up a job in the morning, not liking it, and at lunch leaving, walking down the street and getting a job at another print shop. Now that's a little extreme. Normally what they would do is just move on to the next town when things dried up. There's no longer an international typographical union. And when I was on my trip, I couldn't expect anyone to pay me a wage. 
So what I do is a lot more like a mid-level touring band. I had to re-envision this whole thing for modern times. So I visit privately owned shops. I visit what we call hobby shops that are just in people's basements or garages. I also visit community-based letterpress shops that are usually nonprofits. And I visit schools and universities that have letterpress printing programs. Now, when I go to all those, I teach workshops. I give presentations and lectures. And I'll usually find the time to have some sort of pop-up shop or exhibition where I sell the prints that I've been making along the way. And just like a mid-level touring band, I make enough money to get from there to the next place. Now, this whole trip, though, isn't about just making and selling prints. Prior to my trip, I had read plenty of firsthand accounts of itinerant printers from the 1850s all the way to the 1950s. And I was fascinated with how these guys worked their way around the country and got a paycheck. But I was more fascinated with how they became analog conduits for information. So as they traveled around the country, they'd bring tips and tricks about printing, but they'd also bring rumors. Did you hear this shop closed? These two shops merged? This guy died. Prior to radio and television, that was one of the fastest ways for that information to travel. So as the tramp printers came in, bringing information about new technologies, they also brought in information kind of like news. They were like Johnny Appleseeds of information. Now, I wasn't sure this was going to be a part of my trip at all. I started in January 2015. And I figured with social media and the internet, all this information was ubiquitous, especially in a small community like letterpress printers. There's probably only a few thousand of us in America and probably less than 10,000 around the whole world. So it stands to reason, with that level of connectivity, everybody knows what everybody else is up to. I was completely wrong. January 26, 2015, I hopped on a plane in Buffalo, and my very first stop, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. <laughs> Not too bad, right, for January? That's all the touring bands do it, too. You go uh, down south for the winter time, you come back up for the north. So I went as far southeast as I possibly could. And my very first stop was at this place called IS Projects. And IS Projects, I wrapped up in two days, and I headed right down the road to Boca Raton. It's only like 20 minutes away. And when I got there, I was like, oh, I was just at IS Projects down this way. And they were like, what, where? And I was like, wait a minute. It's Ingrid's letterpress shop. It's right down the road from you guys. And they were like, we've never heard of it. I realized that right away, I was going to be that ligament or that connector between the studios and the shops, just like the old tramp printers were. And I also wondered whether or not bringing tips and tricks about printing was going to be part of what I was doing. I'd been printing for a long time, and I felt like I had stuff to contribute. But with the internet, there's tutorials. I feel like all that information is accessible. As I traveled around the country, what I realized is that there's plenty of regional differences, too, in how these people operate their print shops. One of the things that I found when I was down south, and it's standard equipment in almost all the shops, baby wipes. It sounds weird, right? But there's just enough baby oil on a baby wipe to act as solvent to clean oil-based ink off your hands. So instead of running to the bathroom 30 or 40 times a day, what you do is just wipe your hand off with the baby wipe, and you can keep on printing. It's genius. And I have absolutely no idea why it never caught on up north. I had never seen it. But something that we use up north all the time, scotch tape. We use it for what we call make ready, making things ready to print. So you use it every day, all day. And I'd get down south, and I'd be like, hey, do you guys have scotch tape? And they'd be like, what? And I'd be like, clear tape. You know, you guys have some clear tape in here somewhere. And they'd be like, uh. And I'd be like, what do you guys wrap presents with? That's the, tape I'm, <laughs> that's the tape I'm looking for, and I'm hoping that you have it in the shop. And they'd be like, oh, no, we don't have that at all. We have painter's tape or masking tape. And I'd be like, well, that's not going to do the job. That's way too thick. That's not, that's not what I need. So what I started doing is everywhere down south, I would buy scotch tape. And I would use it while I was in the shop, and then I would leave it behind. And then when I got back up north, I would buy baby wipes. I'd use them. I'd show them how to use them. And then I would leave it behind. So a little less glamorous than being the Johnny Appleseed of information, I became the Johnny Appleseed of baby wipes and scotch tape. <laughs> but the idea is the same, right? Being able to bring those technologies and bring those tips and tricks about printing. Now, I've been talking a lot about printing. But printing is done by printers. And printers are people. 
I thought that this trip was going to be all about printing. Right out of the gate, I realized that it was all about people. What they had learned, what I had learned, how we could share that information. And it was also about being able to come together and navigate this new landscape of modern American craft by reviving a notion from the past. And that notion is that you used to have a formal apprenticeship time where you'd work under a master, and then a formal journeyman time where you would go and learn from other people, and then eventually, hopefully, become a master of your own, settle down, and have an apprentice. You see, I'm what I consider part of a new generation of American craftspeople, and for the most part, we're autodidactic or self-taught. We don't have the benefit of the infrastructure that the unions used to provide when you had that formal apprenticeship time and then the journeyman time and then eventually became a master. So we're out here floating around, learning on our own, and I really feel like that's caused us to sort of lack the skill set that craftsmen used to have. I always use my friend John as an example. John is one of these guys that started making furniture out of reclaimed wood right about the time that it got really trendy and really hot. And he lived in Portland, Oregon. And Portland is like the epicenter of new American craft. This is the place where if you're going to do it, that's where, you're, where you'll be successful. And he was. His business exploded within just a couple of months. He had more orders than he could handle. He was on the cover of magazines. There were articles being written about him. And all those articles started the exact same way. Master woodworker, John so-and-so. And I was like, master woodworker? Whew, he's been doing this a couple of months. <laughs> and before this, he was a salesman. So his stuff was of questionable quality. And it wasn't John's fault, but he had actually never had anyone to learn from. And what it showed me in a lot of ways is that the economy that surrounds this sort of new American craftsman is one that privileges popularity of product in a cult of personality over quality of craft. Don't get me wrong, John's charismatic and he's eloquent and he's easy on the eyes. He's the kind of guy that you want on the cover of your magazine. But at the same time, he's not a master woodworker and he won't be for a long time. And I feel like one of the things that we're lacking, now that we're lacking that infrastructure, is someone pointing over our shoulder all the time saying, this is how you should do it. That's what the master used to say. And a lot of people would actually argue that there's a ton of creative freedom in this, that if there's no one pointing over your shoulder saying, this is how you should do it, then you can do it any way you want, right? Total autonomy. But I would actually argue that that's the problem here. The problem is that we don't have someone pointing over our shoulder saying, this is how you should do it. And it means that you could actually spend your entire life doing it inefficiently, ineffectively, or just plain wrong. Now, what that means, and it's been put far more eloquently by my friend Michael than me, is that you need to learn the rules in order to break them with grace. And I think that's what this is about. What I was able to do with the itinerant printer project is envision a system where I could fund my own journeyman time in my career. And what I was able to do is go and work with other people and learn from them. And when I learned those rules, then I would be able to break them with grace. That's where real creativity lies. That's where real innovation lies. And that's what I'm advocating. That's what I'm encouraging people to do. Learn the rules of your craft. Learn as many as you can from as many people as you can. Proposition them to go work with them. Travel to be with them. Live with them if you can, like I did when I was on the trip. Find a way to fund your own journeyman time. Because when you're there, you'll be surprised by people's generosity. But you'll also be surprised by something else. Because what you'll learn is more than just a skill set it's a context. So many new American craftspeople stand astride two different worlds, the worlds of commerce and the worlds of craft. And I can tell you that the infrastructure for one is way stronger than the infrastructure for the other, which is why we have to build it back up.
by any means necessary. I want to leave you guys with a print that I've made any number of times during the trip. The universe is under no obligation to make sense to you. This is a quote from Neil deGrasse Tyson, and it's completely true. But if you take the time to go out into the universe and learn something from someone else, truly learn it, and maybe even take the time to pass it along to someone else, it will make a tiny part of the universe make sense to you. And if you're lucky, maybe, just maybe, it'll tell you a little bit more about what you're doing here and where you belong. Thank you.